Yeah. We're live. Well, good afternoon. It's Monday, and it must be Monday afternoon coffee break. How are you doing? Joe? I'm good. I'm good, Dr. Stone. How are you, sir? Well, you know, if I'm drinking out of a noble cup, I'm doing just fine. <laughs> I hear you. Um, yeah, so, you know, I've been spending quite a bit of time. Um, well, you know, when I, when I when I do physical exam teaching, we brought in some of the hedonic senses, right? How do you test the first olfactory nerve? How do you test the three cranial nerves that make up taste? And what is the combination? How much does smell influence taste or taste influence smell? And, you know, one thing that is very disconcerting for many people in this COVID era, era is sometimes the loss of smell or the change of smell is their first sign that they indeed have COVID. And um, so I've been spending quite a bit of time reading about and working with patients that have lost their sense of smell and trying to answer the question, can you do smell rehab? Can you actually bring healing to smell? And what are the ways we can do that? Have you had any patients with COVID or people that through a lot of other reasons lost their sense of smell? I have not had one patient who I've actually managed with COVID to date, but seeing people two days a week um, doesn't generate the same sort of volumes, but I, I have been fortunate and my patients have been fortunate that we haven't had to deal with the reality of COVID. Yeah, well, that's, that's, um, that's great for your patients that haven't had to deal with the reality of COVID. Something that, that um, turns out in some of these longer term studies of people who are months after COVID, um, the loss of sense of smell ranges anywhere from long term, anywhere from seven percent to um, up to forty percent of people. And there's quite a bit of data out there now on people trying to figure out why. And some of it, you think of your first olfactory nerve. I mean, your first cranial nerve. The um, much like taste receptors, that we have taste receptors in in a lot of different tissue. Right. That's part of your innate immunity. You actually have smell receptors in quite a few different tissues also, and it modulates central nervous system connections. And so part of, you know, you've read all this stuff on how the brain heals itself. It's interesting when you lose one sense, the other senses become more dominant and they, they help with the healing aspect. Well, it turns out um, one of the great thing about our central nervous system is that smell does, we can actually bring about some improvement and rehab our smell. And, um, they're now to be, and one of the things you can do virtually, Joe, I was thinking of you, because you do virtual appointments, we do virtual appointments, is Yale came through with a, they actually, they tested it. Um, they they call it the Jiffy test. Over virtual, over virtual uh, medicine consults, they have people either make, if they're allergic to peanut butter, make a jelly sandwich, or they make a peanut butter and jelly, uh, or uh, if they're not allergic to peanuts, or they make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and they ask them to smell it, and um, they validated this Jiffy smell test. You, you think of how 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 do you get to evaluate people over right. virtual medicine? And this is a new tool, man, the Jiffy yeah. test. No, that that's interesting, and, and you know it goes back to what you were saying that kind of. The fact that we have taste receptors everywhere, including the gut and the ovaries and the such, and that we have 
you know, smell receptors is all that kind of evolutionary conservancy. You know, when we were more primitive, um, our tissues were a little bit more uh, in a gamish. Like if you look at a fruit fly, they have what's called a fat body. And it's kind of a nonspecific collection of fat cells, immune cells, uh, blood producing cells, and, um, and a, a vascular bed and metabolically active cells, all in the kind of same general non-organized, uh, uh, you know, organized from a, an organizational perspective, but also non-organized from being split down into specific organs with functions. And so all these cells learn to talk to each other at a short distance, what we would call kind of a, a paracrine um, a response, talking back and forth side by side to each other, you know, or shouting down the hallway at each other. And now we've got the, the you know, the endocrine system where, you know, our brain is talking to glands at a distance, our fat cells are talking to metabolic tissues at a difference. And, you know, our bones contributing in a different way. So, you know, a message like osteocalcin, which is produced when we need to make new bone after we've been a weekend warrior, actually sends a message to beta cells in the pancreas that um, we can be more insulin sensitive. And I think it goes exactly to what you're saying. You know, smell receptors served one purpose, but they also, they, they play to that orchestration that we've all talked about. Well, yeah, isn't it, isn't it fascinating? You know, just that when we think we know something, we realize that it's, it's less than the tip of the iceberg. We are the fly on the very tip, tip, tip of the iceberg in our understanding, yeah. it seems, you know. The other thing that intrigued me, you know, we we test smell. Turns out only about 40% of neurologists test the first cranial nerve. So if you're if you're testing smell, and you can easily do it with have somebody sniff some coffee grounds and see if they can smell that or some cinnamon or those are the two more, more common things. Um, you know, a lot of our medications change our sense of smell, nutritional adequacy sense of, changes our sense of smell. And I often ask people what their favorite smell is and then ask why it is. What's Mine? your favorite smell? I would have to say the forest. Yeah. Like I was hiking yesterday. And what memory? I was hiking yesterday, and even though yeah. it was pouring down rain, um, well, I hate to say this, it was partly fresh cut wood because we were at a tree farm where they had cleared some areas, cleared some lumber. But that kind of smell of the land, smell of the trees, and admittedly probably a little bit of the smell of the diesel wrapped up all in it um, uh, is interesting. And the two-stroke engine smell. Yeah. yeah, so go a little farther with that. What uh, What's your earliest memory of that being um, a fond memory, a fond my, smell? My uh, father and grandfather were contractors. So um, getting to go to the job site, getting to ride the bulldozers, knocking down trees and stuff as they cleared, you know, they tried very hard yeah. and they did a very nice job. I mean, they were leaving significant green belts in the 60s, um, you know, um, you know, woods instead of clearing to the back of the property line, leaving like the last 50 to 60, um, um, well, in some houses only 50 to 60 feet, but in other properties, 50 to 60 yards worth of trees up against the property lines when they could. And, you know, it made, um, so there was a conservancy piece to it, but I have to say, 
you know, being a four-year-old little boy and getting to ride the bulldozer and getting to do things like, yeah, go ahead, shove that. That'll bring the blade up. We'll ram it into that tree. So, you know, those sorts of things. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, Joe, because I'm always intrigued how one scent, one scent can really cascade through decades of catacomb memories and emotions, right? So you think of how old you are now and and just recalling that scent and connecting it to memory is, is just the power of those hedonic senses, whether it's smell or smell or taste or hearing or eyesight or touch. You know, it's it's amazing that when you lose when you lose your taste of smell, I mean, lose your smell, smell or your sense of taste. Um, suddenly, those catacombs of connection are gone, yeah. and um, and so I think one of the amazing thing is is that they're doing things with essential oils now. There's an app that you can download that takes you basically through smell rehab since through COVID. That that you can you have four different four different smells, four different smells or essential oils or spices. And and you spend 20 seconds uh, sniffing one of them, five seconds, well, 20 seconds sniffing each one individually. Um, and in the first five seconds, you're just seeing if you can smell it. The second five seconds, you know what it is. And you try to think of your memories of that. So and then the third one is trying to remember the, the foods or the things of that. and and basically what they're trying to do is encourage formation of new synapses in damaged areas that um, it takes a while to rehab, but there's now data out that you can actually begin to grow those new synapses. And, and something we didn't think you could do in a cranial nerve actually reestablish pathways. And, you know, and that's really interesting because for a lot of our seniors, the loss of smell and the loss of taste compromises um, their enjoyment of their food and also compromises the quality because um, fortunate or unfortunate, one of the strongest preserved taste sensations late for seniors is sweet. So, you know, it's only when yeah. they're eating something sweet that they really appreciate it. And feeding back to your piece, this tastes like the apple pie I had when I was young, as opposed to something yeah. that has a sour taste or a bitter taste. Yeah, this isn't as good as what my mom used to make. I'm not going to eat this. I'm going to go have a piece of the apple pie, which does taste like what my mom used to make. Um, so that has anyone done any of this work, rehab work, in the in that setting um, of the elders? Yeah, and the elders. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because you know we know that the sense of smell, the sense of smell is altered, seems to be altered years be before neurologic signs show up. Right. So like before Parkinson's, before Alzheimer's, right? And and your, your next obvious question is a real pertinent one, and that is if you have somebody that has early Parkinson's and you do this kind of, uh, well, let's just call it aromatherapy, is there any sign that it slows progression? Well, I guess how it ties into a lot of this stuff is coming down to root cause and functional medicine, right? So what is the cause for smell loss? Is it inflammation? Is it nutritional insufficiency? Right? Yeah. Is it endocrinologic issues, hyperglycemia? What with oxidative stress? What what is the root cause imbalance that's causing this dysfunction of smell? Because it's the root cause that can be causing disruption, dysfunction in of neurologic networks in the brain, right? So I don't know. It's just. Um, there's a huge rash of people that have a, we talk about the areas of, of function who are, who developed post COVID or via COVID 
dysfunctional cranial nerve work and chronic inflammation. And, uh, and we get to try to figure out how to help them bring balance and improve function. You know, what you said, um, that comment about rash, and then the comment about, um, you know, the connection between the number of seniors who have had COVID and the number of, um, of people experiencing changes in sense of smell and sense of taste is, um, I was wondering about this the other day, the possibility that things that we would normally call idiopathic in the setting of a significant unknown temporally related event, whether, whether mm -hmm. some of the causality may be um, getting attributed and if, you know, and if that partly accounts for the difference between seven to 40% in some of these studies, depending, you know, what they happen to say. I had a friend who not long after, well, about seven to eight days actually after her second vaccine broke out in a fairly significant hives reaction. And, you know, um, she went to urgent care and she had traveled and she had some new dietary exposures in terms of, you know, changing the, the, some of her food sources. And she had some changes in terms of laundry detergents and she had some changes in terms of, you know, personal care items, but none of them were particularly dramatic. And urgent care said, well, we've been seeing hives with vaccines. And, you know, we all know that a significant number of people with hives fall into the category of idiopathic, not even the idiot knows what caused it, right? You know, it's, it remains an unknown cause and we frequently don't find it. Right. But it makes me wonder about, you know, if, if we have an antidote of, oh, I saw hives and I saw COVID, and then we see it a second time, and it, both of those hives may be idiopathic and we link it, are we suddenly, you know, how do we attribute those things to actual conditions? And it, it really made me think about it after our discussion today during our writing group on um, when we were discussing our principal component analysis article about which features we look at with our physician eyes, our clinician eyes, our you know nurse eyes, our chiropractor eyes, our osteopathic eyes, our naturopathic eyes. You know what we look at, you know, um, in terms of important features. But what would the data actually say about you know? Are there more? If if we had data that said how many visits for urticaria there were to um, um, you know, urgent cares prior to COVID and now after the vaccine, has that changed? No, it's a, it's, I wish I could, I could appropriately reference this quote that keen, keen acute observations need to be followed by science to establish yeah. whether that yeah. observation I mean, is goes, linked. And I think right. we are- It goes we, to the point in that, the middle of that right? um, when you're talking about evidence, you know, a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial, though it has lots of faults, is indeed evidence generating and antidotes are probably best thought about as hypothesis generating. Antidotes, then, then you begin to have data. Right. Then it right. becomes and then you can begin to, and of what then you can begin to query. Right. 
Like yeah. it becomes the end of one experience that you and I are wrapped up in. And where I think it becomes really important is, um, you know, when you have a more serious possibility related to a vaccine, like you have an administration of a vaccine and then you have a seizure afterwards. And, you know, do you just describe that as, you know, oh, that was related to um, um, the vaccine or did two things happen and I need to make sure that there's not a more serious reason for me having had a seizure? And, you know, well, that's exactly and true. where do physicians yeah. let people off the hook um, and should or shouldn't in terms of exploring that causality? Yeah, and how um, in our fragmented in our fragmented care, our fragmented episodic care with less and less time, um, it's ripe for the quick, um, it's ripe for the quick analysis without thorough history yeah. and adequate follow-up. And therefore, we we run into, well, absolutely. We run into trouble. And, I mean, we've talked previously about, you know, the benefits of your primary care practitioner being the one who sees you in the hospital and then sees you after the hospital in terms of continuity of care. And, you know, also being the one, you know, you know, when you're taking care of the family and, you know, one family member has an interesting headache complex and you happen to be you're smart enough to ask the question is anyone else at home having symptoms or you know that the other member of the family is having symptoms um, you know because they came to see you and then suddenly you're asking do you guys have carbon monoxide and you find out there's carbon monoxide in the home Right. And I wasn't smart enough to ask the question of anyone else having any symptoms. But when I saw the wife and she felt like I had made some changes that were helping her, her husband came in and with the same complaint. And I was like, wait a minute, you both started getting headaches at the same time. And I got them to check for carbon monoxide and they had a leak in their new home. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's um, it's it's uh, it's something that you don't necessarily in a distracted healthcare system. Yep. There's greater chance of that falling through the cracks. You know. So what if that what if that uh, that husband went into an urgent care, and the the spouse went into and saw you, and they were both both isolated, there was no connection. Um, right. And that's, you know, it's interesting. It, it brings to mind, and that's, I think I shared this with you before, where I noticed the pattern as a ER physician that in a small town, if, if one person came in with a migraine headache, the same total of three people would come in within two hours of each other and this happened time and time and time and time and time again. And then for some reason I thought, what? A police officer came in and I asked him if he had a map of the town or if he could tell me where, where these folks lived in relation to each other. And it turns out they lived on the same pattern of the underground sewage pipe. And so I asked if there was a meth lab or any a meth house or anything uphill. And it turns out there was a meth house a few houses up from where the first person, first migraineer would come in. And then the next the migraineer lived about five houses down. And then the last migraineer lived down the hill and around the corner. And I watched this pattern multiple times. Wow. 
and they busted they busted the meth house because they were dumping junk down the down the the toilet. And you know what? The migraineers all suddenly got better. <laughs> so it's under it's seeing the patterns. It's seeing the patterns, isn't it? Right. So what are the patterns? What are the patterns we see? Right. And bringing it back to smell, I think it's interesting that um, that COVID really gets into the olfactory nerves and disrupts the the cytoskeleton around those nerves via the via the ACE2 receptors. And they enter and they seem to, COVID seems to go retrograde into the central nervous system via the olfactory nerve. It turns out heavy metals, lead and mercury from smog would go retrograde into the central nervous system via the olfactory nerve. It turns out prion disease, remember mad cow disease? Yep. Mad cow disease enters via the olfactory nerve and goes retrograde into the CNS. That's interesting. So it is interesting that these toxins and these viruses in our in our anatomical structure, maybe through the lymphatic system, transfer in and affect the central nervous system. And and um I think when somebody has smell issues with COVID, it's just we have to think about an upregulated inflammatory component inflammasome throughout their CNS. And so this is going to be one of the great, one of the great challenges for the population, for our patients, and for us as clinicians. Yeah. Well, and one of the great revelations is that there can be um Long haul symptoms after viral diseases, so that it uh, brings yeah. some um, brings some respect to practitioners who are pursuing those treatment options, and it's that it brings some um, opening of eyes to patients who um, in the past may have been discounted a little bit, like, "Oh, come on, you don't have chronic Epstein Barr virus, really." And then, you know, can yeah. we move on to something else, please, and close the door on that? So, um, yeah, you know, I think I think that that's particularly novel. Um, so, um, to share with everybody, in about a month, Michael and I, and our co-teachers Susan Buell and Courtney Suter, are doing a ninety-minute. 90 minutes of recreation and visioning together, a morning workshop on the 24th of April. It's going to be right here on Facebook Live. Uh, there may be some unique little opportunities coming up around that event, uh, in particular, uh, making it easier for you to join us out at um, uh, Feathered Pipe Ranch in July. Uh, we're really looking forward to people joining us there. I did the podcast, Dandelion uh, Effect podcast for uh, Feathered Pipe um, this past weekend. And I'm going to be putting the link up on um, our um, website, um, uh, the Joseph Lamb MD page. I'll be putting that link up um, tomorrow. Um, but in the meantime, um, you know, you can go to the Feathered Pipe site, learn more about the retreat we're giving, or join us later on. And um, Michael and I are both seeing patients, Michael down in Ashland, Oregon, and uh, me up here in um, Gig Harbor, Washington. So thank you, everybody, and have an awesome week as we get closer and closer to um, um, summer weather. And and send and in a parting thought, think of the smell that you remember the most that links you to the earliest memory. And what is the smell or the sensation that brings you the most joy? And with that, take care. We'll see you next Monday.